Well, hello, dear friends from the Virtual Conference of Innovation in TVAT. My name is Ian Otero. You already know me as the moderator of the conference. And today we are here with Rodrigo Figueira from the ILO and Cinto 4. And we're going to discuss uh, some of the main questions that we have related to the ICPs or new technologies in vocational education and training. So without further delay, I want to pass the word to Rodrigo. He will present himself, present some of the uh, contributions that he can bring to this subject, and then we're going to move on to the questions. So please, Rodrigo, now the stage is yours. Hello, Jan. Uh, thanks for, for the introduction and thanks uh, for the invitation. Uh, very happy to, to be participating in, in this activity. Uh, let me find my... Uh, I have a very short three-slide presentation um, that I can share with you. Uh, well, uh, as, my, as the first slide uh, indicates, my name is Rodrigo Filgueira Prates. I'm Uruguayan, uh, originally uh, studied software engineering. And I've been working for the International Labor Organization since 1997, specifically at ILO Center 4, uh, which is the ILO office for the development of TVET in Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, I worked two years for the Delta units in ITC ILO. Delta does not stand for any military. Uh, it sounds military, right, uh, from the movies, but it's not. Um, it's the uh, technology and uh, methodological unit for the training center of the ILO, which is located in Turin, Italy. Um, we keep on uh, working together uh, at a distance now. Um, I. Actually, just to make a little bit of story, uh, in the late 90s, um, the World Bank and IDB and many other uh, cooperation banks uh, started offering credits in the region to, for our TVET institutions to uh, go out and buy technology and generate uh, lots of uh, labs with computers and start doing e-learning. Um, you'll get to see what I mean by our network in, in a while, but our network started asking us, what is the thing that they want us to do with e-learning? And uh, in a very cautious way, uh, in the sense that they were not clear uh, what it is that technology was going to bring. Uh, so I started working on developing e-learning and also on researching uh, their, its potential use in TVET around that time. Um, and that gave way to a lot of pedagogical insights, which we may share uh, afterwards, uh, and research uh, in, in terms of applied research, trying to look around and see uh, what was good practice and what was not, uh, in a way, a good idea. I've worked since then in the development of learning platforms, of learning modules, tutor I've been tutoring courses, I've delivered and deliver face-to-face -face training in these uh, areas. Um, and uh, since 2014, um, Center 4 has formally uh, created an area uh, which I'm in charge of, uh, the subject of what it is that we need to do in terms of uh, pedagogical change and how to help, uh, uh, how to use that in terms of, of design to actually start developing transversal uh, competencies or what's called sometimes uh, um, uh, soft skills, right? Uh, there, there's many names for this and uh, it's, a, it's a broad, uh, it's, a, it's a broad category, but mainly it's about developing um, what we call the future skills, uh, skills for the future, which uh, in particular include the development of, of technological uh, skills. Sorry. Um, so that would be a bit the story. Um, what we're working on is uh, what we feel that it's it's a good approach to integrate and generate, uh, create this this, sorry, develop these skills and uh, the technological skills is to go back to something which is not really new. Uh, it's been known for a while, but it's, uh, it would be innovative to actually use it, which is project-based learning uh, as, as a main, uh, mainstream approach to, to designing TVET. 
Um, so if we can, I can see slide one of three and I can actually move them right here. Okay, uh, just a little bit about ILO Sinterfor. Uh, ILO, it's the ILO Special Office for Tibet in Latin America and the Caribbean. It was created in 1963, or so they say. Uh, I was not there um, at the time. Uh, no, to, it was created in 1963 because uh, Latin America was going through the, what was called the substitution of imports. So uh, Latin America as a policy, and Latin America started um, in the 40s, started in industrializing. And there was a lot of need uh, for workforce, for trained workforce. That started happening mainly in Brazil, Colombia in the 40s, Colombia followed, and then the, the tide of, uh, of substitution of imports uh, uh, swept uh, Latin America in the 60s and 70s. So the, um, in the 60s, most of the region, uh, regional governments requested the ILO that uh, the ILO would create this uh, center to promote the Brazilian model uh, towards uh, towards the, the rest of the countries to help technically and also politically because the, the Brazilian model was tripartite as. Uh, was originally tripartite. It remains um, uh, in in many ways. Uh, so the ILO felt comfortable also in in that in that idea, uh, since tripartism is, is central to us. So that's a bit the story. What you can see there are the logos of the institutions that are part of our network. At the moment, it's around, uh, it varies uh, from 67 to 70, and it goes a little bit up and down. Um, and they are members because they actually provide a voluntary contribution. So they actually decide uh, financially how, how they can uh, participate in, in the process uh, of, of being a member, right? Um, so let me go to the next one. Uh, and then, why is it that we're worried about projects with learning and technologies, and, and learning technologies? Uh, I, I mentioned a, a while ago that it's about developing um, skills for the future, and the ILO is making 100 years now. Uh, it's becoming 100 years old uh, this year. Uh, it was created in, in 1919. And the general director opened uh, as a central initiative the Future of Work Centenary Initiative, which uh, has to do with lots of things. Uh, for example, how it is that uh, the uberization of work uh, is impacting unionization, for example. But in what regards to us, it has to do with future skills how it is that we're going to develop uh, or help develop future skills for the Latin American workforce. Uh, that's the, the part that uh, falls into our plate in a way. Um, so that's mainly the reason why we chose to go project-based or inquiry-based learning and uh, to, to start thinking on how to develop these technological competencies in, in the long run. So that's it. Those are my three slides for introduction. Any questions? Welcome. Um, I can I, I can develop further. Uh, there, there's a part of myself that I can actually answer about. Okay. Great, Rodrigo. Thank you very much. Um, so we're going to start with some questions. Um, mm -hmm. We're going to start with some basic questions that uh, would be more related to. Uh, now, let's say the state of the art. What's the state mm -hmm. of the art on ICTs and new technologies and vocation education? No, what, what seems to be the, the state of the art is uh, really, really very fancy technological stuff. Um, uh, I would say virtual reality it's is coming in uh, and it's showing in very specific uh, environments right it's uh, for example um, very high tech or uh, for very um, complex uh, um, production process uh, where actually you cannot uh, it, it, it in a way it has it's uh, parallel with the um, 
the flying simulators, right? Uh, you, you could not, uh, uh, you would not put somebody to train on a real plane uh, until actually uh, something uh, of that kind would happen. Uh, the thing is, virtual reality uh, allows you to uh, work on any environment. You could any physical. Uh, you can, you would be able to simulate any physical uh, uh, environment. So that's one. The other one is the use of games. I think um, the use of gaming for uh, assessing skills in many environments. There's a very nice uh, case uh, of a study which was done by the University of Bremen in the port of Bremen, trying to assess future skills competencies. And uh, they, they actually developed a game to, to try and, and find out what was uh, needed in terms of, of certain specific skills. This was done by the ITB, I think it is. Um, the, the, I, I don't speak German, but I think it means the the technological the technology institute of of the university for education from the University of Bremen. So I would say virtual reality is, is there. Uh, gaming also. Um, I think gaming has. There are two things that we need to differentiate a lot. Uh, there's this gaming uh, gamification thing uh, going around, and there's then there's this serious gaming uh, approach. Uh, gamification works a lot, uh, and is being sold uh, as a tool for motivation. Um, and uh, in long learning processes, it it tends to fall short. Um, whereas serious gaming actually is competency or skill development, um, it's more serious in, in the, it takes a, a, I would say a cognitive and, and psychological, pedagogical approach. It has one in the background. Whereas the other one is, well, the other one also has one, but it's conductist. Uh, it, uh, it assumes that you will be behaving uh, in a motivated manner as if you were playing uh, Candy Crush, right? And you will, you would like to go to the next level and next level. And that, in terms of learning, falls short. Um, Probably, if there's a lot of young people listening to this, they already have spotted my age because Candy Crush was something, it's very old now, right? It's like two years old, right? Uh, sorry for that. Um, but then again, um, I would say uh, virtual reality, we've seen in the region experience with augmented reality. Um, it comes in as a solution to some of our institutions where you don't really have the physical uh, um, instruments to share all the time with all participants, right? Uh, very big institutions with lots of money, but we have, with a very broad scope, very broad coverage of, of the country. Uh, actually, Senai has developed, uh, they, they have these manuals where actually you point to some parts of the manuals with an app they they developed and the machinery pops up in your in, in your telephone right so and you can turn it around and you can see the different parts and how they integrate so it, these are animations uh, which work um, based uh, 3d animations right which you can play with uh, and i that, that thing i think that's for the, the demonstration part right for the more lecturing less interactive part i think it's very useful I think it's very useful. It can be uh, very useful. So I, I would go. I would go there. Um, there are other things that I, I would stop there because there are many other uh, fantastic solutions uh, around. Uh, there are lots of promises regarding artificial intelligence, for example, which uh, I would say in the academic field at least uh, they're very. The, they're not being strongly regarded as actual solutions yet, so I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I would stop there. Uh, of course, there's. I wouldn't say there's a trend when we say internet, right? I wouldn't say that, uh, when we say googling or web questing. Uh, those are trends that are. Uh, those are tools that are quite mainstream already in most of TVET, in education in general. So. 
uh, trying to answer to your trends, I would say this, I feel this is the, the newest stuff. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, you mentioned that, for example, Googling or some other uh, uh, online tools, they're already, they already have been using, uh, are being used already for the past years. And mm -hmm. you also mentioned your experience with e-learning. Mm -hmm. And my question is, uh, for example, as you mentioned in the 90s, we know that there was a, a great focus on e-learning as a sort of solution to many problems to access of vocational education. Mm -hmm. uh, what's your opinion on this? Like, did e-learning did e uh, solve all the problems that they were trying to solve? And if not, why do you think uh, they didn't solve? And what, what's exactly the issue now with e-learning? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, this is... This is a nice one, um, a real nice one. Um, I don't think it solved uh, the problems uh, it set out to to solve, um, because also one of the central issues you could find, uh, or the central uh, pitch uh, points that you would find at that time with the learning is broadening scope and lowering costs. Uh, it, uh, that, that was one of the things that uh, eventually um, was to be, it was in a way magical for managers, right, and for policy makers that they could suddenly actually uh, broaden scope a lot and, uh, and uh, reduce costs at the same time. Um, there was an issue with quality. Uh, one, one of the things that happened is that uh, e-learning uh, kept on. Uh, being designed as face-to-face -face, uh, training was designed, which was very expositive, right? But it was worse because when you have a teacher in front of you and he's being expositive, right? he's being, uh, he's lecturing mainly, he can at least take a look at your face and say, okay, this guy is not getting it. So I'll come back and I'll uh, try another example. So I'll ask the rest of the participants if they understand so eventually they can uh, explain to the, and their, their uh, colleague. Uh, but uh, the year learning removed all that uh, interaction um, and uh, it was, not substituted by anything else um, because the learning design hadn't changed. Um, in a way, you could say, okay, um, let's think of this course in particular or this lecture, right? Any teacher with experience in a course knows, tends to know where participants will actually fall short or won't get it. Right? They have this uh, situation where they say, I know this concept is complex, right? And you don't get it by listening or reading, right? Uh, and they actually develop examples and they develop um, exercises, right? And that is uh, very interactive. That tends to be interactive um, in, in class. Uh, what happens with the learning is that it was content-based, and nobody really knew how to asynchronously uh, create activities, uh, good activities that would um, compensate for the lack of the presence of, of, I'm assuming, a good teacher, a good lecturer, right? Uh, and that was a problem. So the learning design didn't change. So we had a bad learning design uh, in a way that lecturing uh, is, is really not effective for the development of some, some competencies. And it was translated to a much more um, arid, uh, uh, I would say yes, arid uh, environment, which was reading at a distance, right? Uh, that wasn't solved by the introduction of videos. Uh, because it was lecturing uh, n nonetheless, and there was not this um, this uh, way, there was not any way to actually uh, get a hint very fast on what it is that I uh, was uh, not getting or not understanding. So th I think that was one of the problems. The other problem that we found in the region is that uh, e-learning students tend, it is assumed that they are autonomous in a way. 
they are they have the capacity to self organize they have uh, the ability to uh, classify information and decide what's relevant and what's not relevant um, and uh, mostly most of uh, most of our, our students don't have that. They come from a very traditional learning background uh, where everything was set out and ordered in the way they need it. So, uh, and this, this is, I'm talking specifically of our region and, and TVET. But we also feel, we also see this offering of, uh, uh, we have lots of consultancy in education here happening all around in the region, offering our TVET institutions to start doing MOOCs, right? Massive online open. Uh, well, then again, if there's one place where we actually have to have the, those autonomous skills is when you are going through a MOOC, right? Otherwise, uh, you fall behind, you lose ground. That's what happens all around. So then again, MOOCs work for certain very specific uh, sectors of the population. Uh, all these edX programs or these uh, Coursera programs, they work, but the, you, you wouldn't see much uh, TVET uh, students from our region being able to cope with that kind of, of logic, right? They need something more structured, more um, guided, right? Now, I would say those are, I'm trying to, to round up, but the thing is, uh, quality was not uh, was not good enough uh, in terms of it. Actually, worsened the face to face, and um, uh, at, at least at the very beginning. Then the, you can find very good examples all around, right? I'm talking mm -hmm. mainly uh, when you try to make this idea massive. Yes. Uh... 